of all of you. And as payback, I'm going to forego the long and fulsome introduction <laughs> to Professor Chomsky that I have prepared, because it is absolutely apparent he does not need any introduction. <laughs> we have never, uh, this, uh, the scale of the reaction to this lecture is completely unprecedented, so we've all been patient long enough. So um, let me, without further ado, give you Professor Noam Chomsky. King Charles granted a royal charter to the Rhode Island plantation 
declaring that the form of government is democratic, and furthermore declaring that the government could affirm freedom of conscience even for papists, atheists, Jews, Turks, and even Quakers, who were one of the most feared and brutalized of the many sects that were appearing in those turbulent days. All of this was quite astonishing in the climate of the times. A few years later, the Charter was enriched by the Habeas Corpus Act of 1679, formally entitled an act for the better securing of the liberty of the subject and for prevention of imprisonment beyond the seas. Uh, the U.S. Constitution, which borrowed from English common law, of course, affirms, I'm quoting it, that the writ of habeas corpus shall not be suspended except in case of rebellion or invasion. And in a unanimous decision, the Supreme Court held that the rights guaranteed by this act were considered by the founders of the American Republic as the highest safeguard of liberty. Uh, all of these words should resonate today. Uh, the significance of the Companion Charter, the Charter of the Forest, is no less profound and perhaps even more pertinent today. Actually, these topics are explored in some depth by Peter Leinboy's rich, stimulating history of Magna Carta and its later trajectory. Uh, the Charter of the Forest demanded protection of the commons from external power, the king at that time. The commons were the source of sustenance for the general population. Their fuel, their food, their construction materials, in fact, everything that was necessary for life. And the forest was no primitive wilderness. It was carefully developed over generations, maintained in common, its riches available to all, and preserved for future generations. But those are practices found today, uh, primarily in traditional societies that are under threat uh, throughout the world. Uh, the Charter of the Forests imposed limits on privatization. The Robin Hood myths uh, capture the essence of its concerns. And it's not too surprising that the popular British Robin Hood film that many of you I'm sure have seen was written anonymously by uh, Hollywood screenwriters who were bl blacklisted for leftist convictions. Uh, by the 17th century, this charter had virtually disappeared. It had fallen victim to the rise of the commodity economy and capitalist practice and morality. And with the commons no longer protected for cooperative nurturing and use, the rights of the common people were restricted to what could not be privatized. That's a category that continues to shrink to virtual invisibility. In fact, it's now down to pretty much air. Uh, in Bolivia, the attempt to privatize water was beaten back by an uprising that uh, brought the indigenous majority to power for the first time in history. It's about 10 years ago. Uh, the World Bank has just ruled a couple of days ago that the mining multinational Pacific Rim can proceed with its case against El Salvador for trying to preserve lands and communities from highly destructive gold mining. Uh, environmental constraints deprive the company of future profits. Those are crimes that can be punished under the rules of the investor rights regimes that are mislabeled free trade agreements. Now, this is only a tiny sample of struggles that are underway all over the world, uh, some of them with extreme violence. Uh, perhaps the most extreme is in eastern Congo, where millions of people have been killed in recent years uh, to ensure an ample supply of minerals for your cell phones and other uses, and of course, ample profits for those who are privatizing it. The rise of uh, capitalist practice and morality brought with it a radical revision of how the commons are treated and also of how they're conceived. So the prevailing view today is captured by a 
influential argument by uh, Garrett Hardin uh, that uh, freedom in the commons brings ruin to us all. That's the famous tragedy of the commons. In other words, what is not owned will be destroyed by individual avarice. Uh, there was an international counterpart to that. That was the concept of terra nullius. It was employed to uh, justify the expulsion of indigenous populations in the settler colonial societies of the Anglosphere, offshoots of England. Their extermination, as the founding fathers of the American Republic described it, uh, sometimes with remorse, uh, long after their own participation, criminal participation was passed. Uh, according to this useful doctrine, the Indians had no property rights since they were just uh, allegedly wanderers in the untamed wilderness. And the hardworking British colonists they could create value where there was none by turning the wilderness to commercial use. Uh, in reality, the colonists knew better, of course, uh, they, uh, they, they were elaborate procedures of uh, purchase and uh, ratification, both by Crown and Parliament, uh, later annulled by force when the ungrateful creatures resisted extermination. Uh, the doctrine is often attributed to John Locke, but that's dubious. Uh, he was a colonial administrator. He understood perfectly well what was happening. And there's no basis for the attribution in his writings, contemporary scholarship, I think, has shown that convincingly. The uh, grim forecasts of the tragedy of the commons are not without challenge. Uh, 2009, uh, the late uh, Eleanor Olstrom won the Nobel Prize in economics for her work showing the superiority of user-managed fish stocks, pastures, woods, lakes, and groundwater basins, the commons. Uh, but the conventional doctrine, the tragedy of the commons, has force if we accept its unstated premise, namely that humans are blindly driven by avarice, nothing else, no other aspects to their personalities. That's what American workers uh, 150 years ago at the dawn of the Industrial Revolution called the new spirit of the age, gain wealth for getting all but self. Like peasants and workers in England before them, American workers uh, bitterly denounced the new spirit that was being imposed on them, regarding it as demeaning and destructive, uh, an assault on the very nature of uh, free men and women. And I stress women among the most active and vocal in condemning the destruction of the, of the rights and dignity of free people by the capitalist industrial system uh, were the so-called factory girls, the young women from the farms uh, driven into the regime of uh, supervised and controlled wage labor, which at that time was regarded as pretty much the same as chattel slavery differing only from actual slavery and that it was temporary. Uh, that stand was considered so natural 150 years ago that it was a slogan of the Republican Party. It was a banner under which uh, northern workers carried arms during the American Civil War. Well, that was 150 years ago. Uh, in Scotland at the same time, so I've been informed, uh, it was pretty much the same. Uh, huge efforts have been devoted since to inculcating the new spirit of the age. And there are major industries devoted to the task, public relations industry, uh, advertising, uh, marketing generally. It's a very large component of gross domestic product of the economy. Uh, they are dedicated to what the uh, great political economist Thorstein Veblen called fabricating wants. Uh, in the words of business leaders themselves, the task is to direct people to the superficial things of life, like fashionable consumption. Uh, that way, people can be atomized, uh, separated from one another, 
seeking personal gain alone, uh, diverted from dangerous efforts to think for themselves and to challenge authority. Uh, this process of shaping opinion, attitudes, and perceptions it was called uh, engineering of consent by one of the founders of the modern public relations industry in the 1920s, uh, Edward Bernays. He's a respected Woodrow Wilson, Roosevelt, Kennedy progressive. Uh, much like his contemporary Walter Lippmann, the most prominent uh, public intellectual of 20th century America, also a liberal progressive, he praised what he called the manufacture of consent, which he called a new art in the practice of democracy. Now, both of them recognized, I'm quoting them, that the public must be put in its place, marginalized and controlled uh, for their own interests, of course. They are too stupid and ignorant to be allowed to run their own affairs. So that task must be left to the intelligent minority and they must be protected from the trampling and the roar of the bewildered herd, the ignorant and meddlesome outsiders, the rascal multitude, as they were called by their 17th century predecessors. And just like you protect a three-year-old from running into the street, can't allow freedom. Uh, the role of the general population is to be spectators, not participants in action in a properly functioning liberal democracy. And the spectators must not be allowed to see too much. Uh, President Obama, in fact, has set new standards in safeguarding this principle and protecting the spectators from trying to understand what their betters are doing. Now, he has, in fact, punished more whistleblowers than all previous presidents combined. It's a real achievement for an administration that came to office uh, promising transparency. Most famous case is WikiLeaks, in this case, as you know, with British cooperation. Well, over time, uh, societies uh, have become more free, and the resort to state violence has become more constrained. And it has therefore been recognized uh, that it's urgent to devise more efficient methods of control of attitudes and opinions. This was recognized, for example, by the British Conservative Party 100 years ago. And it's very natural that uh, the immense public relations industry, propaganda industry basically, uh, developed, was created in the more free societies where it's needed. You don't need it so much if you have the cudgel, uh, the US and Britain. The first modern state propaganda agency was the British Ministry of Information, as it was called. These ministries always have Orwellian names. Uh, the British, uh, the, the uh, uh, British, British Ministry of Information was formed about a century ago, and in secret it de de defined its task as to direct the thought of most of the world. Actually, what they were interested in primarily was progressive American intellectuals who had to be mobilized to come to the aid of Britain uh, during World War I. Uh, there was a US counterpart established by Woodrow Wilson, Committee on Public Information, another Orwellian title. Its goal was to drive a pacifist population uh, to violent hatred of all things German with remarkable success. So for example, the Boston Symphony Orchestra wouldn't uh, play Beethoven, you know, because it's German. Uh, American uh, commercial advertising also deeply impressed others. Uh, Goebbels was uh, particularly admired it, and he adapted it to Nazi propaganda all too successfully. Uh, the Bolshevik leaders uh, also admired it, and they tried, uh, but their efforts were clumsy and ineffective, never worked as well as the Nazis. Uh, a primary domestic task has been to keep the public from our throats. It's Ralph Waldo Emerson describing the concern of political leaders when the threat of democracy was becoming harder to suppress in his day, mid-19th century. 
in more recent years, the activism of the 1960s elicited elite concerns of what was called excessive democracy and calls for measures to impose more moderation in democracy. And one particular concern was to uh, introduce better controls over what were called the institutions responsible for the indoctrination of the young, the schools, uh, the universities, uh, churches, which were failing that essential task. Actually, I'm quoting reactions to the 1960s from the left liberal end of the mainstream spectrum, the, uh, the liberal internationalists who uh, staffed the Carter administration, their counterparts in Europe and Japan. Uh, the right wing was much harsher. But one of the many manifestations of this is the sharp rise in tuition, uh, which has no basis on economic grounds, as I think is easily shown. Uh, but it, uh, the device does, however, trap and control young people by debt, uh, often for the rest of their lives, and it thus contributes to more effective uh, discipline and indoctrination. While pursuing these topics farther, uh, we see that uh, destruction of the charter of the forest uh, and its obliteration from memory, barely known today, uh, that relates rather closely to continuing efforts to constrain the promise of the Charter of Liberties. Uh, the new spirit of the age cannot tolerate the pre-capitalist conception of the forest as the shared endowment of the community at large, uh, cared for communally uh, for their own use and for future generations, protected from privatization, protected from the transfer to the hands of private power for service to wealth and profit, not the needs of the, of the public, the commoners in earlier terms. And uh, inculcating the new spirit of the age is an essential prerequisite for achieving this end and for preventing the Charter of Liberties from being misused uh, to enable free citizens to determine their own fate. The most famous part of the Charter of Liberties is Article 39, uh, which declares that no free man shall be punished in any way, nor will we proceed against or prosecute him except by the lawful judgment of his peers and by the law of the lands. Uh, through many years of struggle, progress and regression, uh, but through many years of struggle, the principle has come to hold more broadly. So the U.S. Constitution, uh, which borrowed from Magna Carta, uh, provides that uh, no person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law and a speedy and public trial by peers. The basic principle is what's called presumption of innocence. It's what legal historians describe as the seed of contemporary Anglo-American freedom, referring to Article 39. And with the Nuremberg Tri Tribunal in mind, described as a particularly American brand of legalism, punishment only for those who could be proved to be guilty with a fair trial uh, uh, through a fair trial with a panoply of, proceeding, of procedural protections, uh, even if their guilt for some of the worst crimes in history was not in doubt. As you may recall, uh, Churchill and others uh, wanted to just kill them, and the Americans who sort of dominated it insisted on a kind of a fair trial. There's many questions you can ask about it, but some kind of a trial at least. Uh, the founders of the American Republic, of course, did not intend the term person to apply to persons. Uh, for example, Native Americans were obviously not persons. Uh, their rights are virtually nil. They had the right to be exterminated. Uh, women were scarcely persons. Uh, wives were understood by Blackstone, British common law, American law, to be covered 
term was, under the civil identity of their husbands in much the same way as children were subject to their parents. I'm quoting Blackstone, uh, the very being or legal existence of the woman is suspended during the marriage, or at least is incorporated and consolidated into that of the husband, under whose wing protection and cover she performs everything. Uh, one of the arguments in the United States for not granting the vote to women was it would be unfair because the husband would get two votes, uh, his vote and the vote of his property. Uh, and in fact, in general, women were the property of uh, the, the fathers and then their husbands. Now, those principles, incidentally, extend right to the modern period. So, for example, uh, uh, until a U.S. Supreme Court decision of 1975, uh, women in the United States did not have a legal right to serve on juries. You know, they were not peers, so charter didn't apply to them. Uh, just uh, two weeks ago, a Republican opposition uh, barred what was called the Fairness Paycheck Act, uh, guaranteeing women equal pay for equal work. And in fact, it goes far beyond. A uh, person's still a concept person hasn't properly extended yet to women. Of course, slaves were not persons. Actually, they were three-fifths human under the Constitution so as to grant their owners greater vote, voting rights. Uh, protection of slavery was no small concern to the founders of the American Republic. It was, in fact, one factor. Some legal historians believe the major factor uh, in leading to the American Revolution. There was a good reason for that. In uh, 17, uh, in, there was a case, famous case in 1772, the Somerset case, when where Lord Mansfield determined that slavery is so odious, his word, that it cannot be tolerated in England, although it continued in British possessions for many years. Uh, American slave owners could see the handwriting on the wall. Uh, if, they, if the colonies remained under British rule, uh, that would apply to them. And you have to, one should bear in mind that uh, the slave states, including Virginia, had the greatest power and influence in the American colonies, the ones who pretty much ran it. Uh, one can easily appreciate uh, Dr. Johnson's famous quip that we hear the loudest yelps for liberty among the drivers of Negroes. Uh, Post-Civil War amendments extended the concept person to African Americans, ending slavery in theory, not in reality. Now, there was a decade of relative freedom, but after that, a condition akin to slavery was reintroduced by a North-South compact which permitted effective criminalization of uh, black life. So, for example, if a black man was found standing on a street corner, he could be accused of vagrancy. Uh, if somebody said he's looking the wrong way at a white woman, he could be accused of uh, attempted rape. Uh, and once they were in prison, uh, they had very few chances of ever escaping uh, the system of uh, slavery by another name. It's the term used by Wall Street Journal Bureau Chief Douglas Blackman in a quite arresting study, recent study of this topic, bringing to light a lot of what was known only in the corners of scholarship. Uh, this new version of the peculiar institution uh, provided much of the basis for the American Industrial Revolution. It created a perfect workforce for uh, the steel industry. Andrew Carnegie, one of your representatives, and uh, mining uh, along with agricultural production and the famous chain gangs. Workforce that was docile, uh, obedient, no strikes, uh, no need for employers even to sustain their workers. It's an improvement over slavery. Now, the system lasted in large measure until World War II. Then free labor was needed for war production. And then this came the post-war boom that offered employment. A black man could get a job in a unionized auto plant 
earn a decent salary, maybe buy a, buy a house, maybe send his children to college. That lasted for about 20 years, uh, until the 1970s when there was a radical redesign of the economy, and I stress design, it didn't happen by economic law, explicit decisions. Uh, the new redesign on the newly dominant uh, neoliberal principles established all over the world. Uh, in the United States, that meant rapid growth of financial institutions and offshoring of production. Well, that meant that the black population was largely superfluous. And not surprisingly, it's been recriminalized. Uh, until the Reagan years, incarceration rates in the United States were within the spectrum of industrial societies, a little toward the high end, but not out of the spectrum. Uh, by now, it's far beyond others. In fact, by far the greatest in the world for any country that has statistics. Uh, the targets are primarily black males, increasingly also black women and Hispanics. They're largely guilty of uh, victimless crimes uh, under the largely fraudulent uh, uh, drug wars, which have very little to do with drugs, but a lot to do with uh, getting rid of the superfluous population and counterinsurgency abroad. Uh, meanwhile, the wealth of African Americans, uh, African American families, has been virtually obliterated, virtually down to zero after the latest financial crisis, in no small measure, thanks to the uh, criminal behavior of financial institutions, uh, with, of course, impunity for the perpetrators. They're now richer and more powerful than ever, getting ready, ready for the next crisis. Well, if you look over the history of African Americans from the first arrival of slaves almost 500 years ago to the present, they've enjoyed the status of authentic persons for a few decades. One indication of what a long way there is to go to realize the promise of Magna Carta. The uh, post-Civil War amendments uh, did grant the right of persons to former slaves, though mostly in theory. Uh, at the same time, uh, they created a new category of persons persons with rights, uh, corporations. Uh, almost all the cases brought to the Supreme Court under the 14th Amendment, the main amendment, uh, had to do with uh, corporate rights, not the rights of freed slaves. And by a century ago, the courts, not legislation, but the courts had determined that uh, these, as the legal literature calls them, collectivist legal fictions, which are established and sustained by state power, corporations, have the full rights of persons of flesh and blood. In fact, they have far greater rights because of their scale, their immortality, and their protections of limited liability. In fact, by now, their rights far transcend those of mere <coughs> humans. Uh, under the mislabeled free trade agreements, as I mentioned, Pacific Rim can sue El Salvador for seeking to protect communities and the environment. Uh, individuals, of course, cannot. Uh, General Motors can claim national rights in Mexico. There's no need to dwell on what would happen if a Mexican demanded national rights in the United States. Uh, domestically, uh, recent Supreme Court rulings uh, greatly enhance the already enormous political power of corporations of the super rich, uh, striking further blows against the tottering relics of functioning political democracy. I assume you've been following that in recent weeks. Uh, meanwhile, uh, Magna Carta is under more direct assault. So recall again the Habeas Corpus Act of 1679 which in particular barred imprisonment beyond the seas, and certainly, of course, bars the far more vicious uh, procedure of imprisonment beyond the seas for the purpose of torture, what's now more politely called rendition, as when Tony Blair rendered the Libyan dissident Abdul Hakim Belhad, who's now a leader of the rebellion, 
They rendered him to the mercies of Gaddafi, then a good friend. Or when uh, US authorities deported Canadian citizen uh, Maher Arar to his native Syria for imprisonment and torture, uh, later conceding that there was never any case against him, and many others, uh, very often going through the Shannon Air Base, which did lead to courageous protests in Ireland. The concept of due process has been extended under the Obama administration's uh, international assassination campaign, which is highly hailed. Uh, the Justice Department explained that the constitutional guarantee of due process, uh, tracing back to Magna Carta, is satisfied by internal deliberations within the executive branch. And the constitutional lawyer in the White House agreed with this. Uh, King John might have nodded with satisfaction. Uh, this issue arose after the murder of uh, Anwar al-Awlaki. He was accused of inciting jihad in speech and writing, and also unspecified actions. A headline in the New York Times captured the general elite reaction when he was assassinated in a drone attack, along with the usual collateral damage, other citizens sitting next to him, a couple of other people. Uh, the, uh, uh, the headline read, the West celebrates a cleric's death, that is, the deliberate murder of uh, a cleric who was saying the wrong things. Uh, there were some eyebrows lifted because he was an American citizen. And that does raise questions about due process, uh, which are considered irrelevant when non-citizens are murdered at the whim of the executive. Uh, and they're irrelevant for citizens too uh, under Obama administration legal innovations. Well, what about presumption of innocence? That's also been given a new and useful interpretation. Quoting the New York Times from the Justice Department, uh, Mr. Obama embraced a disputed method for counting civilian casualties that did little to box him in. It in effect counts all military age males in a strike zone as competence, according to several administration officials, unless there is explicit intelligence posthumously proving them innocent. So in other words, post-assassination determination of innocence maintains the sacred principle of presumption of innocence. Uh, would be perhaps ungracious to recall the Geneva Conventions, the foundation of modern humanitarian international law. Uh, they bar the carrying out of, exec of executions without previous judgment pronounced by a regularly constituted court affording all the judicial guarantees which are recognized as indispensable by civilized peoples, wherever they may be. Uh, the most recent case, the most famous recent case of executive assassination was of course Osama bin Laden, who was murdered after he was apprehended by 79 naval SEALs, you know, super special forces, a defenseless, uh, accomp accompanied only by his wife. Uh, his body was reportedly dumped at sea without autopsy. Well, whatever one thinks of him, he was a suspect. And in fact, nothing more than that. Uh, even the FBI agreed. They said they had only suspicions that he was responsible for 9-11. In this case, celebration was overwhelming. Uh, you really had to look hard to find a question. There were a few on the fringes, a few questions about the bland rejection of the principle of presumption of innocence, that particularly when trial was hardly impossible, it was straightforward in fact. Uh, these criticisms were met with very harsh condemnations. And they're pretty interesting. The most interesting one that I saw was by a uh, respected uh, young uh, left liberal uh, political commentator, Matthew Iglesias. And he explained, I'm quoting him, that one of the main functions of the international institutional order is precisely to legitimate 
the use of deadly military force by Western powers, okay? So in his words, it's amazingly naive to suggest that the United States should obey international law or other conditions that we righteously demand of the weak. Uh, only tactical objections can be raised to aggression, assassination, uh, cyber war, or other actions that the holy state undertakes, of course, in the service of mankind, like their predecessors. Uh, if the traditional victims see the matter somewhat differently, that merely reveals their moral and intellectual backwardness. And the occasional Western critic who fails to comprehend these fundamental truths can be dismissed as silly, Iglesias explains, uh, and so he's referring specifically to me, and I cheerfully <laughs> confess my guilt. Uh, perhaps the most striking assault on the foundations of traditional liberties is a case that's little known and virtually undiscussed. It was brought to the Supreme Court by the Obama administration, who won with the help of the right-wing justices. It's called Holder v. Humanitarian Law Project, if you want to look it up. The Humanitarian Law Project was condemned for providing what's called material assistance to the Kurdish PKK. It's listed as a terrorist group by the state executive. Uh, there were rulings about material assistance, but in the past it meant providing weapons or something like that. But the Obama administration extended material assistance, in this case, to include specifically legal advice if we have legal advice to a group that they designate as terrorists, that's material assistance. Now, the wording of the ruling, if you read it, uh, appears to apply quite broadly. For example, to discussions and research inquiry, uh, even advice to keep to nonviolent means, that's material assistance, just to explain why. The right-wing justices, incidentally, didn't go quite as far as the Obama administration wanted. They wanted even more a severe attack on elementary civil liberties. Well, again, there was a marginal fringe of criticism, but it's interesting that even the limited published criticism accepted the legitimacy of the state terrorist list. These are arbitrary decisions by the state executive with no recourse. Uh, their counterparts in other uh, Western societies. Uh, the record of the terrorist list is of some interest. So, for example, in 1988, the Reagan administration declared Nelson Mandela's African National Congress to be one of, in their words, one of the more notorious terrorist groups in the world. Uh, therefore, Reagan could continue his support for the apartheid regime and its murderous depredations at home and particularly in neighboring countries, as part of his war on terror. Actually, 20 years later, Mandela was finally removed from the terrorist list, and he now can travel to the United States without special dispensation, uh, special waiver. Uh, another interesting case is Saddam Hussein. Uh, he was removed from the terrorist list in 1982 so that the Reagan administration could provide him with support for his invasion of Iran. And that support was quite significant. It can spread Britain too, incidentally. Uh, support continued well after the war ended. In 1989, uh, President Bush, that's Bush number one, the good Bush, President <laughs> number one uh, even invited uh, Iraqi nuclear engineers to the United States for advanced training in uh, nuclear weapons production. Well, it's more information that must be kept from the eyes of the ignorant and meddlesome outsiders. Uh, one of the ugliest uses of the terrorist list has to do with the tortured people of Somalia. Immediately after September 11th, the United States closed down a Somali charitable network, called Barakat, on the grounds that it was financing terror. If you look back, you'll see that this achievement was hailed as one of the great successes of the war on terror, lots of publicity. Uh, 
in contrast to Washington's withdrawal of the charges as without merit, uh, barely was mentioned. But meanwhile, things happened. Uh, Al-Barakat was responsible for about half of the $500 million remittances to Somalia. That's more than it earned from any other economic sector, and 10 times the amount of foreign aid that Somalia received, according to a UN review. The charity ran uh, major businesses in Somalia, which were all destroyed. Uh, the leading uh, academic scholar of Bush's so-called financial war on terror, Ibrahim Wardin, he concludes that apart from devastating the economy, this frivolous attack on a very fragile society uh, may have played a role in the rise of Islamic fundamentalists. It's another familiar consequence of the so-called war on terror. Actually, the very idea that the state should have the authority to make such judgments is a serious offense against the Charter of Liberties, as is the fact that it's considered uncontentious. Try to find a comment about it. And if the Charter's fall from grace continues on the path of the past few years, the future of rights and liberties looks quite dim, I think. Well, a few final words on the fate of the Charter of the Forest. Recall that its goal was to protect the source of sustenance for the population, the commons as they were then called, protect them from external power. In those days, royalty over the years, enclosures, other forms of privatization. By now, predatory corporations and the state authorities who cooperate with them and are properly rewarded. And that damage is very broad uh, if we were to listen to voices from the South today, we could learn, I'm quoting, that the conversion of public goods into private property through the privatization of our otherwise commonly held natural environment is one way neoliberal institutions remove the fat, fragile threads that hold African nations together. That politics today has been reduced to a lucrative venture where one looks mainly for, looks out mainly for returns on investment rather than on what can contribute to rebuild highly degraded environments, communities, and a nation. This is one of the benefits that structural adjustment programs inflicted on the continent, the enthronement of corruption. So I'm quoting a Norwegian, a Nigerian poet, an activist, uh, Nemo Basi, he's the chair of Friends of the Earth International. It's a searing expose of the ravaging of Africa's wealth called Took Up the Continent. It's the latest phase of the Western torture of Africa, which goes way back, of course. And torture that has been planned at the highest level. Important to recognize that, and still is. So at the end of World War II, the United States, of course, held a position of absolutely unprecedented global power, and not surprisingly, careful and sophisticated plans were developed about how to organize the world. Uh, each region was assigned what was called its function by State Department planners. They were headed by the distinguished uh, diplomat George Kennan. And he determined at the time that the United States had no special interest in Africa, and so therefore uh, he recommended that Africa should be turned over to Europe to exploit, his word, for the reconstruction of Europe. Uh, in the light of history, uh, one might have imagined a different relation between uh, Europe and Africa, but there's no trace in the internal record that any of that kind was ever considered. Well, more recently, the United States has recognized that it too must join in the game of exploiting Africa, joined by other new entries, among them China, which is busy at work compiling one of the worst records in destruction of the environment and oppression of its hapless victims. It should be unnecessary to dwell on the extreme dangers posed by one central element of the predatory obsessions 
that are producing calamities all over the world with the attack on the commons, namely the reliance on fossil fuels. Now that courts global disaster, and perhaps in the not too distant future, uh, details can be debated, but there's very little serious doubt that the problems are serious, if not awesome, and that the longer we delay in addressing them, the more awful will be the legacy left to generations to come. There are some efforts to face reality, but they are much too meager. Uh, tomorrow, the Rio Plus 20 conference opens uh, with meager aspirations and even lesser expectations. Uh, meanwhile, the power concentrations are charging in the opposite direction, led by the richest and most powerful country in world history. Uh, congressional Republicans are now dismantling the limited environmental protections that were initiated by Richard Nixon, uh, who would be something of a dangerous radical in today's political scene. Uh, the major business lobbies quite publicly announce their propaganda campaigns to convince the public that there's no need for undue concern, and with some effect, as polls show. The media cooperate by not even reporting the increasingly dire forecasts of uh, international agencies and even of the US Department of Energy. Uh, the standard media presentation is a debate between alarmists and skeptics. Uh, alarmists are virtually all qualified scientists. Uh, uh, skeptics are a few holdouts. Interestingly, not part of the debate is a very large number of experts, uh, far beyond the skeptics, includes, as it happens, the climate change program at my own university, MIT, among others. Now, these skeptics uh, criticize the scientific consensus because it's too conservative and too cautious, and they argue that the truth is much more dire. Uh, not surprisingly, the public is confused. Uh, in his uh, State of the Union speech in January, President Obama uh, hailed the bright prospects of a century of energy self-sufficiency uh, thanks to new technologies that permit extractions of hydrocarbons from Canadian tar sands, uh, shale, uh, other previously inaccessible sources, and others agree. The London Financial Times forecasts uh, century of energy dependence, independence for the United States, including, they say, a century of global hegemony. The report does mention uh, the destructive local impact of the new methods, poison water supplies and so on. But unasked in these optimistic forecasts is a very simple question. Uh, what kind of a world is going to survive the rapacious onslaught of another century of rapid exploitation of fossil fuels. Uh, in the lead in confronting the crisis throughout the world are indigenous communities, uh, those who have always upheld the charter of the forests, just as the commoners did in England in the 13th century. The strongest stand uh, has been taken by the one country in the world that they govern, uh, Bolivia, poorest country in South America, and for centuries a victim of uh, Western destruction of the rich resources of what had been one of the most advanced of the developed societies in the hemisphere pre-Columbus, quite developed. Uh, after the ignominious collapse of the Copenhagen Global Climate Change Summit in 2009, Bolivia organized a people's summit with 35,000 participants from 140 countries, uh, not just representatives of governments as in Copenhagen, but also civil society and activists. Uh, they produced uh, what they called a people's agreement, which called for a very sharp reduction in emissions and a universal declaration on the rights of Mother Earth as they called it. In fact, that's a key demand of indigenous societies all throughout the world. It's ridiculed by sophisticated 
Westerners, but unless we can acquire some of their sensibility, they're likely to have the last laugh, and it'll be a laugh of grim despair. and thanks all of you for coming. I'm afraid the room is too big and the microphone's too spare to allow for questions. So again, please join me in thanking Professor Noam Chomsky for speaking.